Hello to our friends listening to this recording of the Visual Tools meeting, Visual Tools meeting number 17. Uh, this group has been meeting during 2022 and now after a break, we are back with a few updates about different projects in, in the closure scene of data visualization and literate programming and UI design and so on. And um, we will have uh, presentations um, uh, in a moment and then uh, have a discussion. But first, uh, as uh, Matthew uh, suggested, maybe we could discuss how this group began and, and what we are uh, about. And maybe if you wish, Lucas, would you like to, to, to tell a little bit about this group? Yeah, sure. Um, like it's been one and a half years now, uh, right? It hasn't already been two and a half, right? I'm getting old. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> and it was at the reclosure conference um, where a lot of people were presenting their visual tools, something like Clerk and Portal and other the, the Vega based stuff that was really nice. And I wanted my library to be able to integrate into all of those. And I wanted to be like egotistical and make other people work for me. And I just wanted to plug in into that somehow. And I was kind of annoyed that like every one of those basically has their own API and then like you need to read about it, you need to connect to it and something. And a lot of work was basically redone by multiple libraries, right? Like Portal has their own viewers and Clerk has their own viewers and so on and so on. And there's a million ways of getting Vega to run and so on. And so I was complaining to Daniel at some point that like we need some way well, I kind of need some way to like only talk to one of those things and everything else magically runs. So we should somehow make a group where everybody collaborates instead of building everything uh, from scratch 10 times. And then you all kind of uh, the, the next day, basically, uh, right? More or less inside the reclosure conference, we started this, the first session of this group. It wasn't officially called the visual tools group yet, I think. Uh, but it was basically the first impromptu session of it, where we took all those visual tools creators, put them in a room and told them they need to now work together um, instead of everybody building their own thing. Um, and I think it's been going pretty nicely, um, where first of all, people learn about tools that they didn't know before and that have like interaction with their own thing. And they can now work together to like, not solve the same problem 10 times, instead put some library underneath it and like all use the same library. Best example is my current Calva notebook thing, where instead of building the 10,000 viewer of the same data, I'm just using portal to put a portal window in there and uh, I don't have to do the work. Uh, that's why we have Chris uh, working on portal and I can just be lazy and pretend that it's all my work basically. Um, and yeah, the visual tools group has been going for those one and a half years where we've basically met once every month, I think, uh, more or less on average, uh, probably. And a lot of cool new tools came out of this. A lot of cool co collaboration between different people came out of this. And yeah, I really like it. And thanks, Daniel, for organizing it every time. Thank you so much. Yeah. Such a nice way to tell the story. Yeah, so um, maybe if it makes sense now, uh, maybe what we could do is uh, tell a bit about ourselves and not, you know, maybe not everybody uh, is required to tell something, but uh, I think it makes sense uh, for the people to kind of uh, get to know each other, even though we have met in the past. And so maybe we could spend a few minutes. Uh, so anybody is invited to tell something about what you're interested in, if you're working on a relevant project or what you're hoping for the coming weeks and months or anything you find relevant to tell. And yeah, so um, maybe uh, Maurizio, would you like to begin and tell something about yourself? Sure, okay. So Mauricio, I live currently in Uruguay and I do windsurfing. So that's a new thing. And well, I basically worked a lot on the chlorine project. They uh, made a chlorine project. It's a plugin for Atom. 
and Atom died. So I decided to try a new editor when it was trying, almost dying. And the idea was to reuse parts of Atom that was already that were already made to make a new editor from scratch in ClojureScript. And when Atom died, I thought, okay, so now I don't have the like the, the basis of Atom to base myself in. So I decided to basically fork the whole thing and start everything else. So that's why I'm going to talk right now. And yeah, I've been out of Clojure for a little bit because of all this JavaScript nonsense that I had to do with Atom and everything. But yeah, basically that's it. Hopefully I can go back to Chlorine soon and rethink a lot of things based on what I learned here. Beautiful, thank you so much. Um, uh, maybe uh, Ian, hello, would you like to? Say something. Okay, a few words. Um, I work for Flexiana, it's a closure contracting company. Um, and so I'm like programming closure full time. Uh, the My interest in the, the, the uh, visual tools thing is sparked by the reclosure conference but not, not much put into practice yet. I mean, I've played with various tools. Um, mostly these days I'm using, just using Emacs with uh, org mode and running little bits of code from there. But um, I'm interested to see what's, gonna, what's happening. Um, yeah, that's about it for me, I think. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Marcus, hello, would you like to say something? Yeah, hi, um, I'm Markus and I have a physics background and also come from the Reclosure 2021 conference. So I gave a presentation there about visual programming. And that's basically how I joined the Visual Tools Group. And the, the keynote of this conference was given by Gerald Sussman, which was very interesting. and. I'm still working on the same topic and uh, trying to make his SICM book more accessible to everyone. That's basically it. Beautiful, thank you. Um, uh, Chris, hello. Hello, I think I'm the only Chris in this room. <laughs> Usually there's more than uh, one, of, one of us. Um, yeah, uh, my name's Chris. Uh, been using Clojure since like 2016-ish. Uh, I've been able to work with it professionally for the last three years. So um, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And in, in that time, uh, I've uh, found some problems that I've solved with my tool that I've been working on called Portal, um, which uh, is, is, has, has, has been a lot of fun. And it's been fun like integrating it into different weird places. So um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything interesting to say about me. <laughs> Yeah, we may hear more later. Yeah, thank you. Um, hello, John. Would you like to say something? Hello. Um, yeah, my name's John. I'm uh, an engineer. I've been doing um, recently working with a bunch of startups doing closure. And um, it's been very interesting. A lot of, uh, of data-orientated work there as well. Uh, and so I've been spending the last uh, couple of months uh, trying to improve the workflow and portal was one of those things that um, has made a big change in that but I still think there's a, I've got a lot to learn about how to make the most out of everything that portal can do uh, so thanks Chris for that and um, yeah looking forward to kind of seeing what's happening with the other tooling as well uh, I write around about the use of tools and workflows around closure in the uh, the practically uh, books that I publish online and uh, I want to try and do some more uh, videos around that as well soon. Thank you so much. So nice to meet again. Yeah, and um, uh, by the way, uh, JNPN is writing to us uh, in the chat. Uh, I'm a French dev trying to see how data science goes outside of Python. Thanks again for making these meetings. Yeah, and, and yeah, so we will 
talk about data science more in coming meetings, even though this one is more about tooling, of course. And yeah, by the way, I'm Danielle. I uh, usually do statistics, but recently I left my job. And so I'm now focusing mostly on community organizing uh, in the closure community. Um, yeah, um, Matt, uh, would you like to say something? Sure. Thanks for uh, inviting me here. Came here through the Slack group. So I'm excited to meet you all and see everything that you're working on. I've seen a few of your previous recorded videos. Um, I've been working with Clojure professionally since about 2018, mostly on backend stuff. But recently, I've been playing around with Portal, playing around with Clerk a bit, working more on UI stuff, and separately sort of dipping my toes in the water of uh, data science as well. So happy to be here and looking forward to seeing what everyone's working on. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Adrian, would you like to say something? Hi. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. Hi, I'm Adrian. I'm uh, interested in visual tools and building uh, tools that you can with uh, direct manipulation so much so that I built my own UI library. So as kind of uh, a lot of the tools are focused on running visually in the web. Um, I'm focused on doing it on desktop primarily. So um, kind of going against the grain there, but uh, if, uh, hopefully that can add to the conversation of different environments where you can do um, data visualization, direct manipulation, and do it in process as opposed to the web, which has its own challenges. But the desktop has different challenges, but has different uh, capabilities that are interesting. So yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And that is one of those projects we are hoping to hear more about in the next times and maybe a little bit today. So um, yeah. Uh, so maybe we should begin now. Oh, Lucas, Lucas, yeah, maybe you would like to say something about yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a closure deaf in Germany, sitting in the middle of Berlin. Right now, uh, I work for a company called Scarlet. We do healthcare regulation stuff, and we're building our own LSP tooling on our own language and stuff. That's why, I mean, I've always been interested in just tooling for developers. Like, it's way more fun if the tooling do, does my job instead of me having to do my job. I'm just not smart enough, so it's nice if the tooling does it. Um, and right now I'm working on uh, one of, being one of the maintainers of Kalba. Um, and I've put lately, uh, the, the, I've put in the Kalba notebooks, um, which we'll see later. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. So now we will begin with the presentations. We will begin with Marcus. Uh, and uh, maybe what we could do is try to talk for 10 to 12 minutes. I think that would be optimal with the time we have. You know, if you need more time, then never mind. And I'll try to tell you after 10 minutes so that you can try to conclude. And so, Marcus, would you like to begin? Sure. So I share my screen. Um, so, okay. So, as said in the introduction, I still want to make the SICM book more accessible. Now, the question is what is the SICM book? Um, it is the second book in a series uh, written by. Gerald Sussman and others. The first one in the series is probably the most widely known one in the computer science community. It is the wizard book, Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. The next one is the book I'm focusing on, is the Structure and Interpretation of Classical Mechanics. And the third one is Functional Differential Geometry, which uh, kind of brings the concepts further. Um, and my goal uh, 
since the reclosure conference is to make this mechanics book, SICM book available to MATLAB and Python users. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to reach to reach out to, to people who have not heard about Lisp and, and closure. And how I, how I do this is uh, I, I have two approaches. Uh, first, I want to run the whole book in the browser so that uh, you need no backend. Uh, it's just as a web page. So everyone can open it and, and use it. And then uh, the second step is to provide some interactivity for recoding the physics examples that are in the book. So first, you, you should be able to look at the examples of the book and maybe execute them. And in the second step, you should be able to somehow interact, interact with the book. Um, and the domain of my talk here is uh, thus purely domain specific, which is in, in uh, uh, contrast to most of the presentations we have in this visual tools group. Um, because usually people talk about general purpose tools like Calva Notebook or Portal, Clerk, uh, Maria Cloud is always also a nice platform. And, and you can use those tools for lots of various things. And uh, it's very important to understand that I'm really only focusing about presenting this, this book here. It's, it's for nothing else uh, at, at this stage. Um, what is this book? Uh, is, is, it's a book about theoretical physics. So it's not about data science. It has no numbers in it. It's all about algebra, symbolic manipulations. So think of it more like uh, MATLAB or NumPy. Uh, it's not like MATLAB and NumPy. You should, you should think more of it about uh, as, as Mathematica and SymPy. But nevertheless, I, I, I'd like to reach those people who use MATLAB and NumPy currently and, and maybe want to want to try symbolic computations. Um, and these are really the, 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 the main focus group. The, the book itself uses the MIT scheme language because it is written by, by Gerald Sussman, an MIT professor. And it contains examples about planet movements and rigid bodies and many other physics uh, examples. But the book itself, only uses a small fraction of the scheme language, but uses a lot of higher order functions. So functions to the second, third order functions, calling functions, functions, returning functions, which themselves call functions. So it's all really, really high order functions to the max. It's really using this concept very effectively. Um, and the functions, they all interlock and, and one can go as far as say, because of this interlocking and higher order nature of things, uh, really those functions themselves form a DSL, a domain specific language to model algebra really. So uh, a computer scientist would say it's a DSL, a domain specific language. Mathematicians, physicists would say it is a notation. It, it's really defining or using and an, an, an its own notation basically. Well, that's the book. So um, having lots of examples, but uh, it comes with a library. Uh, also, of course, by, by MIT, written in MIT scheme. And this library was rewritten uh, into Closure Script by Colin Smith. He started and Sam Ritchie took it way, way further in the last years, one can say. And uh, I think it's, it's good to think of of Lisp being used in this library as a language-oriented language, which is stolen from Racket. So Racket is also a Lisp, a modern one, and the Racket slogan is language-oriented language, um, which means in this library that a com computer algebra system is defined really, that the, the domain-specific language is defined, the notation is defined within the library. So notation is used in the book and defined in the library. Uh, it's closure script, so it works in the browser. Um, and if you want to know more about the library, you could listen to the REPL podcast of January 12th, where uh, Sam Ritchie is talking about an hour about this library and, and where it all goes. Now, to make the book accessible 
which is the task, the single task I like to pursue, uh, you have to connect the book to the library in the browser. And there are two ways. I think maybe there are more, but there are two main ways to do this. The first one is translate the book itself to closure. So make the examples that are within the book, that are scheme examples, just translate them to, to closure and then run it, run it with the closure script library. Uh, this has been done uh, by Sam Ritchie. He, he created lots uh, of org files. Uh, there's also a link to it and, and, uh, and um, my presentation at the visual tools meeting in uh, 2022 was based on his porting the scheme code to closure code. So I, 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 on top of it, I made a GUI where you can interactively uh, work with, with those examples written in closure by Sam. Um, I could give a short uh, presentation, but I think I don't have the time to it. And it uses Kittle because the main thing I like to talk here is this uh, the second way, which is the scheme DSL uh, transpiler in the browser. So the second way is just not to use closure, but uh, show the examples like they are in the book in the browser and use a, a scheme transpiler to transpile things, in that case, to JavaScript. Because what I'm doing here is I'm using, I'm using uh, the, the library, the SigMutis library, purely as a JavaScript library. So there is no closure stack involved in this, in this idea. Um, and I can show it. This is the, the, the main thing I'd like, I'd like to show. Um, and this, this is an HTML file, which includes the transpiler and all the hundred examples of the book of the first part of the book. So this, this, this is all scheme code. And the scheme code is transpiled to JavaScript. And the SigMutis library is used as a JavaScript library, uh, which you can see. You see, this is, this is the transpiler. It's only 160 lines of code. And it uses, uh, it imports like any any closure script library just has its namespaces exposed as JavaScript objects if you don't use the advanced optimizations. And that's what I'm using. Uh, and so I can transpile to JavaScript and call the library functions in that way, and that works. It uses clips. I'm already having 10 minutes, right? Um. You have uh, you are around nine minutes. So okay, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. finish in, in, in. I don't need five minutes anymore. Hmm. Um, right. So um, it's it, it uses clips. Even the transpiler itself is is uh, coded as a clips snippet within the HTML file. So there is no external JS imported or something. It's all because the transpiler is so small. It's all in clips snippets. Um, as you can see, for example, here there is a there is an example which which uh, calculates the cosine of pi, right? Um, which is minus one. But if in the transpiler, of course, pi somewhere is defined in the transpiler. If I make it to three, not three point fourteen, but three, okay, then clips is with every key keystroke that this this code is executed. So Clips knows now, okay, P pi is 3.0. And then if you go down to the example, okay, it will not be minus one anymore, but, but something else. Um, so that's the, basically in a nutshell, the idea of the whole project. So it uses Clips, it uses SigMutils as a JavaScript library, as shown before. Um, what else? Uh, closure namespace is, is a, just a JavaScript object. It, the, the transpile itself only lives in HTML. As said, there is no other external file. It's always, it, and, and I developed this transpile in a series of blog posts for educational reasons. So one could, in principle, if one comes from a MATLAB uh, or, or Python background and knows a bit of JavaScript, there is no need to, to know about closure list or something because it's everything in JavaScript and the transpiler is developed in JavaScript itself. And 
by writing the transpiler, basically the DSL is defined, the Lisp is defined. So one understands by writing a transpiler, understands what Lisp means really. Um, and and it is it is uh, developed along with with the math examples of the book. So it, the transpiler, for example, doesn't have an if it didn't didn't show up in the first part of the book. So I didn't implement it. If it should show up, I need to implement in a further blog post. So it goes along with the book. The transpiler is developed along with the book. This HTML file here is written manually. So this is not. It's it's really that's the source of truth. It's not a kind of generated by some other tool. It's really the HTML by self. And it can be, of course, copy pasted locally. So it is very copy paste friendly. You can always look at the source, which is very simple, really. It, it, does, it shows basically the HTML file. There's no so much difference. And so that's very uh, copy paste friendly. Um, and really the main purpose of the transpiler is to, to write blog posts. Um, it includes the, the, you can include this, this HTML file here as an iframe and have access to the transpiler and, and use it and work and write blog posts. Um, right. So that brings me to the conclusion, uh, which is the outlook. Um, what I have is, as I said already, I have part one of the SICM book as the HTML file. This is what I showed. And it exists also as an org file, which is then used in the CLJ tiles, which I didn't have time to show, but was shown in the, in the reclosure conference and in the last year's visual tools meeting. So part one ex exists in as well in, in, uh, with the transpiler as well as in a graphical form. Um, of course, in, in the future, the natural goal is to port both books, SICM and FTG, as I've shown above there uh, in full. Uh, Sam Ritchie already made a lot, lots of org files and lots of works, but I need to adapt them and, and work. And, and But I will not rush through it because I want to enjoy working through the examples myself. That's why I wrote the transpiler, to really work through the examples and understand things for an educational purpose. Um, and then I think it's a good idea to, to add the scheme DSL, which uh, exists as a transpiler in JavaScript right now as a macro in, in Skittle. Uh, so one can write blocks in Skittle and OCLJ tiles is the graphical, uh, the graphical tool I made and presented in, in the conference. And it uses Skittle and so that's a good, that's a, I think it's a good idea to also implement the DSL in Skittle. And then it can be used in other platforms as well. Maria Cloud, for example, uses Skittle. Next John uses Skittle. So Skittle uh, is, is the, of course, the closure interpreter written by uh, Wokdude. I, I, I hope you know him. Um, very famous. Ah, and then maybe one could add Skittle to Clips, which at the moment doesn't, doesn't work. I will never write an HTML to org converter. This is left to posterity. Well, that uh, concludes my presentation. Uh, the rest is all personal opinions. I, I could I could talk on and on and compare and why and not and 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 precursors, but that's maybe left to another session. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marcus. Um, does anybody have small questions to Marcus? Uh, at this moment. Yeah, the um, transpiler that you wrote, how was that process? Where you, you, you said there's only a subset of scheme used in the book. Did that make it easier to write such a small transpiler? Exactly. So, so as I said before, it's, it's really, you can, you can, uh, follow the path of this process really. And uh, we will we'll share the link then in the, in the show notes. It's written in, a, in, in seven sequences of blog posts and it's really test-driven development, which means, okay, I have this special example of the book and I, this needs to run. And that's the way I did it. I said, okay, I want to start with one plus one. It needs, it needs to transpile one plus one into JavaScript one plus one. And then and that's how I work. Ah, okay, now I need symbols. Okay, now I need functions. And so, and, and, and it's everything very well documented in, in this series of blog posts. And 
with with all the, the the philosophy behind it, and it's it's very well documented. It, it, the whole thing is written really as an educational purpose for people coming from MATLAB, for example, with no knowledge about least no knowledge about transpilers or something else, just to 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 give them an entrance into into the book, which is written in scheme and very dense and everything. But it's I think it's worthwhile. So that's the idea. Very uh, single focused. Uh, task I did there, and that's why it was easy because I, I had a specific a specific problem. I didn't write only tool uh, tools for 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 general purpose, just special. Yeah, I think you I got that's very cool. Beautiful. Yeah, and maybe maybe Marcus, you would like to just say uh, like yeah, comment briefly about lips, which is maybe not so. Um, it has been famous, but maybe not so mentioned recently so worth a comment about what it is uh, and um, would you like to say something more about clips yes yes so clips is really from, from a terms of uh, from, uh, from visual tools really i'm presenting clips here as a visual tool <laughs> because that's the that's the backbone uh, and 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 what it does you can you can write uh, Java, it, it's you can easily imp, uh, import it as as uh, in in a block, so it's it's very block friendly. And and on the Clips website, this is very nicely documented how to in, include a, a Clips snippet into a blog post HTML file, basically. And what it does, it, it first of all it, it interprets JavaScript. So you have uh, if you, if you if at, at any keystroke you get an you get a. a, a a result, which is very unique. I didn't find any. That's why I'm using it basically. And it shows the and it shows the result. I didn't. I didn't. I do not know of any other tool uh, which which provides this out of the box so easily uh, and and usable in a blog post. And as said, it's it's for for users who who just don't know uh, about about tooling and 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 stack and everything. So it clips is is is, is very nice described how to use it. And the way, and the cool thing about it is, it, it supports many languages. It supports uh, Clojure, but also Python, also Ruby, and all, of course, in in the form of of JavaScript interpreters. And it also has a, a, a scheme uh, mode, which which I can use uh, quite uh, quite nicely here because it, it uh, formats my my scheme scheme very. Uh, very nicely here. So this is all the formatting is done by clips, and yeah, and you can you can hear cosine of zero. Well, this is my transpiler here. So I'm using I'm using uh, clips only in the JavaScript mode because the transpiler is written in JavaScript and uh, in in and in, in my transpiler mode, not in the closure script mode actually. It, it is written it is written for closure script. But uh, to to uh, include uh, seeking utils as JavaScript library library, I I I I, I didn't know how to use Clojure. So Clips is great, um, and 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 I think uh, would deserve a, a presentation on its own as a as a visual tool for for Clojure uh, for the Clojure community. Because as said, if if anyone knows something, it exists since two thousand and sixteen, and if anyone knows something like it. Which shows uh, the 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 uh, result at keystroke um, out of the box. Then 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 one of the purposes of, of of this presentation would be to discuss about maybe how to how to further this concept within the closure community because we have Maria Cloud which works kind of similar, but you have to have special keystrokes, and I don't know what's better. I just found this to be very useful uh, and exists since a very long time. Thank you. Maybe, uh, maybe I was not too long. Yeah, that was helpful. And yeah, we should come back to this story uh, in a future meeting. Yeah, and maybe uh, let us move to Maurizio's presentation. Uh, so Maurizio, I will tell you about after 10 minutes and then uh, you can kind of start concluding. Um, okay, so let me share my screen here. Hopefully I remember how to do this in Zoom. Okay, so here it is. I suppose you can see it, right? Yes. Wonderful. So 
Yes, yeah, so basically, well, yet another editor. I feel it's the third time I'm doing some presentation on this, on some kind of editor. But basically, it's a fork of Atom, as I, as I said in the beginning. And I decided to do this presentation for another talk. So there are some stuff that I have to cut down. Hopefully, it works. But, well, first thing is, when I say that I'm working on a fork of Atom, most people say, but Atom is, and I want to start by saying, no, it isn't. I mean, it's not slow. It's not, it does not consume a lot of memory. This all things happened pre 1.0, pre 1.2, I think. And Atom is actually pretty fast. But, but Pulsar, well, uh, it's a slower to load and faster to operate because we had to do some trade-offs for reviving the editor. And we already proven that it will become even faster when you upgrade to Electrum, the newest version, because as you can see on the newer slides, things are rough as of now. So the first thing that happened after Microsoft announced that it was going to sunset the project, we had to rewrite the backend. Atom had a backend that says, okay, here are the packages that you can install. Here's where the telemetry will go and everything else. Somebody decided to rewrite the backend. And I am really glad for that person because if it was not for this rewrite project, I would not be working on Pulsar because it's a lot of work, basically. And as soon as I found that they there were people working on the project, I decided, okay, so let's make it easier to bootstrap. I removed 5,000 lines of code that custom scripts, migrated things to Yarn. And why Yarn? Because it's the only one that works. Good job, Node, for compatibility. It's literally the only package manager that works for bootstrapping and installing dependencies on the Atom editor. And I tried to bump to the newest Electron version that will not break too many things. It broke things, but basically there were telemetry things that we are not collecting anymore. And I don't believe that this is a feature nowadays, no telemetry instead of, um, I mean. So just a little bit of facts, Atom died on Electron 9. If you are famous about Electron, you know that at the time the version was 22. So we were 11 versions behind the newest, which in JavaScript terms, this means like a, an eternity. We were able to bump to Electron 12, remove adult telemetry on the process, so it was a, like a double win. And as of now, we can run the editor on Electron 23, but there are a lot of breaking changes and plugins that won't work. But I mean, it, it is a huge milestone that we were able to get. So to summarize a little bit of the breaking changes that I, I found, if you want more details about that, you can see my other top list curse versus list PNV. But basically, NPM8 broke compatibility with 7. That's why we migrated to Yarn. Electron 12 broke compatibility with 10, but that was all telemetry stuff, so it doesn't matter. 13 broke compatibility with 12, and that affects the core library that powers the editor. So we would not have any editor anymore on Electron 13. We are able to migrate this this library super string to WASM, so now it works. And Electron 14 <laughs> broke compatibility with the 12, and it affects one of our tokenizers, the three seater. So, and 21 broke the other tokenizer. So, if we would not do anything on the editor, we will not have like the editor. The, and if we could have the editor, we'd not have any kind of syntax highlighting. So, that's kind of amazing that things are. Are working. So we decided to move really fast, make it easy to hack. And one of the things that I hate when I see like open source projects, especially especially considering editors, is like when you go to the GitHub page and see, well, to, to run this code, clone, install these things, then build a binary. And I was like, no, I want a binary to try right now. So from the first moment, we already were offering binaries, even on like feature branches. So people would be able to simply jump and use the latest, latest thing for multiple operating systems, even sign it. So it's kind of interesting this. And we made the CI work again 
not green just work. So you can imagine the state that things were. We disabled the rebrain and fixed the broken test. It's still a work in progress. We are trying to remove in-house dependencies. There are a lot of them, but we don't have manpower to, to basically maintain them. And rewrite three theater that like insanely that was done. We could do that. So we now have like a newer tree sitter that basically works the same as everyone else and not like an early implementation. But here's the, the core of the thing, why bother? And like the, the editor of the Atom had, at least in my opinion, one of the most interesting plugin systems I ever saw. And it was really, really well documented. And I try to write plugins for an LVIM to even to Emacs and VS Code. And still up to this day, I think the Atom is one of the most interesting that I ever saw. And one of the reasons of that is that they call the Service Hub. Basically, plugins can offer services for the editor. So this element here, it's a plugin. So we have the editor here. This is core. But this is not core. Well, it's a core plugin, but you can disable and have no autocomplete in your system, or you can replace it and have a different kind of autocomplete, even with different UIs or basically whatever you want. I mean, it works like that. And this plugin, it's called Autocomplete Plus, and it defines a service called Autocomplete, and it's a consumer of the service. And what this means is that as soon as you ask for it complete, it will display this UI element on the editor that's completely on the plugin side. There's nothing, the editor doesn't even know that this thing here exists. And it also offers a provider for this autocompleted. It's the default provider. Basically, they call it subsequent provider. It's something like this end appears somewhere in the editor and it will to sort by proximity. So if the end appears before the key, the end is the first element. But as soon as you can, as you have another plugin, let's, for example, think about Chlorine. It can offer a different provider for the autocomplete. And now autocomplete plus have two providers and can ask for completes from this one or this one. And now we have like a more semantic thing, like ID, clipboard, element enable persistence. These were all really elements of, from the JS Atom. And they are all provided by Clarine, which means that every plugin can offer a service easily and other plugins can consume that service and enrich the original plugin experience. And they are independent. Clarine doesn't know that it's talking with Autocomplete Plus. It knows that, that it's talking with a service so if the autocomplete plus doesn't exist, it doesn't matter. Clarine works the same. And, but again, this could probably be implemented in other editors. So why again? And so I, I decided to use the, uh, the experience with Clerk here. I tried Clerk a long time ago, but basically it worked like this. I had a Firewatcher, a server and some kind of API to show elements on the, on the browser. These were all internal from Clerk, but these need to exist because the repo here needs to somehow interact with the, the editor and the browser. So we have a repo, we have all these things, and the repo, it talks to the server. Oh, it, it basically not talk. It, uh, opens up a service that opens up a file watcher. Your editor will connect to the repo and the browser will connect to this server. And now you only need this because the repo, it's called, it's talking in repo. The service is talking HTTP and, and web services. The file watcher is talking its own protocol, depends on the operating system. And the browser, it's a different thing altogether that only understands HTTP and web sockets. So supposing we can make this a single thing, like a pulsar, it's the editor. So pulsar is Electron, so it's a browser. It also is Node, so you don't need all this interaction. You can just connect to the repo and display things on the UI. And it's, in, it's powerful, sufficiently powerful that you can display on any place on the UI. You, you 
don't need to, for example, a web view or anything. That's how powerful the, the editor is. By the way, and, we are around 10 minutes. So good yeah, time to start concluding. Yeah, so only if that's not enough, we have an interesting like config system, like with explicit types, line numbers, no risk pain because you don't have to type shift and comments. And if this sounds really weird, this format sounds really weird, please remember that today is the April Fool, so it's it's not real. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Yeah, beautiful conclusion. Thank you so much, Maurizio. Um, any comments or short questions to Maurizio? I was looking forward to using some go-to statements. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's only a plugin uh, uh, config system, so it doesn't have go-to. <laughs> yeah, I had a quick question. Um, so when, or basically, I'm just curious what other, if any, um, kind of alternatives to like Electron plus Atom that, uh, like, I think you did mention some of the other alternatives that you, uh, or that you were interested in the plugin system from Atom. I'm curious what other kind of alternatives uh, you looked at. Oh, you mean like if any? Well, basically, I wanted an editor that could have like web view because I actually tried Nell VIM in the past, and I don't like this idea of like everything being needing to be like text elements and and so on. I want like a rich experience. I tried the. Uh, I think it's Nial VIM. It's the only Nial VIM fork or implement, not implementation, but basically a UI element that have a programmable web view, but I could not make it work correctly. And I tried like VS Code, but the interaction of the editor and the web view, it's really complicated. You need serialization. And in the end, I thought, okay, if I need to serialize my code, to put things in a web view, what difference does it make than just use a browser and put my stuff there? So for me, um, Atom is like the sweet spot. It's it's both a Electron, it's both a browser and Node.js happening at the same time. Do you, uh, I mean, it, it sounds like, uh, so it sounds like the web view is kind of a requirement. Did you, um, I mean, what about not using a web view? Is that um, is that something that you looked into at all? Well, can you make a I don't know a powerful enough thing without a web view in a graphical user interface that I did not have to write from scratch? Because I mean, most most systems Eclipse, I don't know, Kate code blocks, they are not extensible. You can put some UI elements and that's it. And I think that I, I didn't found, find an editor that have this kind of thing of like, put any UI element, any place that you want, and the editor will understand that and it will not crash. Cool, sounds good, thanks. Lucas? Thank you. Yeah. yeah, to comment on that, like I'm one of the, the Calva crazy people uh, writing that. And one of the reasons I like the, the thing I'm going to show later with the notebooks is that VS Code really is in your way sometimes, so like often. Where it's like I've got a really nice editor and now I just want to put inline values after you evaluate something. And like they just don't let me. I can put it into like a hover. And then you can't resize the hover and so on. Like you've got these problems and you want to have like a rich displaying of stuff, but they just, there are certain spots that where you have like a little window, you can put a rich stuff in there, but that stuff again, can't interact with the stuff around it. Like uh, when you do a web view in VS code, you've now got like a strange event loop handling and in there, like it's basically a browser that's not really connected to the editor. So I understand why you would want to have an editor that where it's like, it's not in your way. It's that like, yeah, sure. You can shoot yourself in the foot and like destroy the user's interaction with it. 
but it's also like if I know what I'm doing, I can like you can run some closure code and I can give you the actual value or the stuff that's happening in the middle of your code instead of having to do a notebook. We're now doing notebooks because then I can do it, but it would be nice if I can just do it in the normal editor, right? And in something like Atom, you could do it and probably in Pulsar you can also. Yeah, Pulsar is basically a fork with the same API, so you can. And that's something also that's interesting because when we bump it to Electron, the newest one, it got faster because the rendering engine and everything else got faster. So we, I think Chlorine runs about 50% of the speed in the newest Electron, which is a huge, like it's half the time. And I was like, what did I do? And basically nothing, I just bumped the Electron. But to, to answer the question, to, to, to complement something that Lucas said, Atom is powerful enough in a way that we are trying to add some layer for VS Code plugins. So basically, to an extent, well, to an extent of what we could implement, we can display things that are made for VS Code inside Atom because the API of Atom is so powerful that you can implement all of VS Code inside of it. The opposite is not true. Like you cannot put all that Atom supports inside the VS Code. As an example, I think in line, in line results, you cannot put HTML in this, only text and maybe markdown. Thank you so much. Yeah, and so maybe we'll discuss more later in the discussion. Um, that was beautiful. And now uh, we will move to Matthew's, uh, Matt, Matt's uh, presentation about ChatGPT. Okay, share my screen here. So mine is more of a hobby project than something I expect to continue working on. But I do think that other people are working on potentially much better versions of this. So I'm, I'm sort of excited to see what comes out of uh, the space of using, using ChatGPT or just the sort of like REPL-like workflow in native language to uh, iterate on code. So let's see, you should be able to see my screen now, right? Yes. Cool. So what I did was I built, um, you know, I was playing around with ChatGPT. I was having it output code. I was just starting to do some like web development stuff. I suck at web development. I don't really know how to make JavaScript work very well. I'm, you know, whatever, not good at drawing SVGs. So I was playing around with ChatGPT, getting it to output like, hey, draw me an SVG of like a down arrow to see if I could get it to put that in, in the top of a window and like animate it so it turns when I click it, whatever. Um, and I decided to write a Chrome plugin to basically render the output from ChatGPT inside of an iframe to just close the feedback loop a little bit more so I'm not like copying and pasting the code. So um, its answers are a little bit different every time, but I'm going to put its prompt in and we'll see what it does. I'm going to ask it, use GPT-4 because it's usually a little bit better. Uh, but so I'm going to ask it to help with some code and then hopefully it will be correct. And usually there needs to be some sort of iteration on the code that it, that it puts out, right? Um, so this is a browser plugin. It is not a chat GPT plugin. They haven't given me access to that API yet. But that's part of why I think that people are going to be working on better versions of this because they do not have a plugin API. Uh, so you know, people don't have to do the same hacks that I'm doing to change this output. So you'll see it's writing some code. And then what my plugin does is it just adds this little render button. So right now, it's only loaded the HTML because it's still writing the CSS. So you'll see like the, the unstyled output here. Um, and then when it finishes the CSS, we can add that in. And when it finishes the JavaScript, we'll add that one in as well. I have had some success getting it to draw charts as well. So still pretty basic, but I had it like, well, maybe we can try this in a second. I had it uh, write some JavaScript to connect to an API, pull some data from the API, and then render it in a chart. And it was kind of a, like a negotiated process to get it to do this properly. But I think it would be really cool 
And I think it will be really cool. Like people are gonna build these plugins to make this much, much easier. So you're gonna be able to have a conversation with this thing while it's iterating on like the chart that you wanted to build or the data sources. Okay, I think this is done. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so it builds this little window and you can see the source code here. Like all, all my plugin is really doing is creating an iframe instead of the code block that it's outputting. And then it's, it's allowing you to select which of the code blocks that it has outputted that you want to include. Um, and then it sticks them all together basically in, in the order that you tell it to. And we get something like this. So then we can tell it like, um, I don't know, draw an SVG R. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> Especially with SVGs, it can still be very hit or miss. Like if you tell it to draw a complicated shape, like a clipboard, sometimes it'll do like an amazingly good job of drawing a clipboard, and other times it'll just be like weird crisscrossing lines. See if that works. So you know, it outputted some new HTML. It did draw a star properly. <laughs> it's got its basic shapes. And oh, cool. Okay, that more or less worked. Let's see. I'm gonna try anyone with GPT 3.5. It's a little bit faster. Um, I'm gonna ask it to draw a chart. Can you plot a sine wave using JavaScript charting library? Okay, that was faster. I have also played with trying to get it to output closure script and then run the closure script through a compiler. And so far what I've found is that the JavaScript that it outputs is much better, but if you have it output JavaScript first and then tell it to translate to closure script, it comes out much better. So with like a real plugin for this, you could imagine doing these sorts of like iterated prompts in the background to make the, the UX a little bit nicer, but it's all still so uh, patchwork that it's hard to know exactly how. Okay, there we go. Let's plot that sine wave here. Um, and let's say I have a sine wave. Let me fetch. Um, data from a public API about rainfall per month in California. I assume this is the census. Wants to take in. <laughs> it doesn't require it. Okay, let's see how this one goes. So far, really, in, in terms of web development stuff, I've only used this as like a getting started thing or to develop isolated elements, like I was saying, SVGs or like these little window things. But it, it has been interesting to see how much it can get done on its own. And for me personally, this has reduced the amount of inertia around starting something new. Where like, I'm like, okay, I don't really program in JavaScript or I don't do a lot of web dev stuff or I don't have to have a built Chrome plugins before. It's cool to have it sort of start this process for you. Uh, um, let's see, I'll put some HTML. Weirdly, a lot of the time when I ask it to output HTML, it tags it as PHP. I'm not sure what that says about its training set, but closure seems underrepresented, PHP seems overrepresented. Um, yeah, this one might be a little, a little too much for it. Give me the previous two JavaScript code blocks. Yeah. This example was too much. As you can see, the complexity ceiling is relatively low at the moment. Um, but hey, if anyone wants to try it out, it's on GitHub here. And I did submit it to the Chrome store. I'm not sure if they'll approve it or not. I'm 
might be breaking some policy or another. Um, yeah, but that's all I've got here. Thank you so much. So interesting. And um, yeah, um, does anybody wish to ask anything? Have you tried doing the same thing with uh, CodePilot instead of ChatGPT? Uh, I would guess that it's better actually producing code, but I don't know. I haven't played much with it. Since so in closure, it tends to like do too many parents or too few to parents or whatever. Yeah, um, I haven't tried this specifically with Copilot just because uh, mostly I use IntelliJ and I'm actually not familiar with the plugin system at all here. So I haven't tried that. I will say like I've, I've been using Copilot and I found it's most useful for like autocomplete things rather than code generation. Like I've tried to get it to do algorithms. I think the only thing I really had success with was I had like a random number generator with uniform numbers. And I was like, can you write a thing to make this a normal distribution? And it did like, you know, the box roller transform or whatever. It's like, okay, I got that one. But with other things, I haven't been able to get it to generate more than like one line of code ahead and have it do a very good job. But it's been super helpful. Like it, it makes programming a little bit faster than it would be otherwise. It just tightens the feedback loop. So I wanted to compliment a little bit because, well, we were experimenting with some editors like Cursor that basically made some of the stuff. And I did try to write a plugin system for the poster that uses ChatGPT to generate code. And it's actually 60 lines of code. So if you want to take a look, I can guide you oh, through that. That sounds awesome. Because yeah, you can basically, again, we are inside uh, the editor. You can basically try to generate the code and pick up the result and display an SDVG and see if it works. That's, it cuts. yes, I would love to try that. Is this? Is it online somewhere? Yes, it's on my GitLab. I, I will send the link here in the chat. Cool, cool. Sorry for disappearing for a moment. Um, yeah, um, maybe Matt, could I ask um, about the process? Certainly. What was possibly um, uh, surprising, because right, in a way, working with ChatGPT is maybe a little bit a, a different mode of programming, discovering what we can receive and we, what we cannot receive from it. And yeah, maybe you wish to comment about this experience of working with it. Um, on, on programming in general, you mean, or, or specifically for, for, for this plugin? Yeah, for the, for the process you have been doing. And yeah, yeah, I mean, honestly, I've been, I, I see why people are, are skeptical about its utility because it's not like, you know, you just type in what you want and it will build the whole thing for you, which frankly wouldn't be any fun anyway. Um, but I think it's pretty cool that you can tell that like, you know, I've never built a, a Chrome extension before and um, Chrome APIs update and break more frequently than other things. So like the most recent uh, version that was working with shadow of CLJS like wasn't working anymore and I have to go through and read all this documentation and figure out how to make it work. Went a lot faster with ChatGPT because it did give me a framework that almost worked and then I had like two or three things that I had to fix to get started. Um, but I don't know, more generally, I'm just excited to see what people are building with this because I think like it's, it's interesting that the wow moment for this GPT interface came when they put this chat feature on top of it like to everyone, not just to people who already liked working with REPLs, this process of like iterated conversation and result turned out to be the thing that made it like a joy to use. Um, so I think we're gonna see a lot more of that, like this this sort of interface in, in different environments appears to be a winner. So I'm excited. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah, uh, any more comments or questions before we move to the part by Lucas? No, just to say that I linked the the repository already on the on the chat. Oh, thank you, thank you. We will share it with the summary of this meeting. Thanks. Yeah, so maybe Lucas, you would like to tell about Calva Notebooks. Yeah, sure. Um, so 
cover notebooks have been a thing for like, I think about four months now. Um, we're using notebooks and VS Code at work uh, to do like displaying of our custom language. And I was like, while I was building it, I was like, well, I mean, getting that into cover doesn't seem that difficult. Um, and so like over a weekend, I was able to like get it in there and it's been a nice experience. There are things that were missing initially where I was like, well, I kind of want to display richer stuff than just like pretty printed values. Um, so yeah, like in a similar way as starting this group, but, uh, I was like, well, I kind of don't want to build this myself. Um, Chris is way better at building JavaScript displaying stuff. So I kind of want to like just steal his work. Um, so I was talking to him how we can get portal into Calva notebooks. And that's been a thing as well for like three months now or whatever. Um, but we've always had the problem that basically in Calva notebooks, you're running some code, then it gets pretty printed, it gets put into the cell, and then portal can take over and display that value. That works great for kind of small values, um, but once they are big, you don't really want to print the whole thing. Um, or if the if they're even basically infinite, if I do a range from zero to infinite, um, it doesn't work very well to pretty print them. Um, and We've now managed to connect portal in a very similar way as it's usually connected, where instead of giving it the whole value pretty printed, it just gets a way to get at the value and does the connection itself. So it can lazy load stuff in the background. The whole value doesn't have to be pre-computed and it doesn't need to like present the whole thing to uh, Calva or to the browser or whatever. Um, I'm gonna show it up right now. If I manage to hit the correct button, we'll see. Had too many nests of oh, there we go. Uh, hopefully, there we go. Yeah, that seems correct. Um, is this zoomed in enough? Can you guys see that okay? Nobody's crying, that seems uh, positive. At the, at the moment, I don't see anything. You don't see anything. That's oh. not ideal. Uh, it's telling me I'm sharing. The, the VS Code window. I can, I can see, see it. it. I can can see it. Is this showing or not? For me, it's showing. I can oh, see. Maybe it is just me. Sorry. Okay. Uh, you should be seeing like a notebook CI namespace. Hopefully. Right. Yeah, okay, cool. Right. Um, so this is uh, the, the, the Calva notebooks, just a normal Calva window. And to get here, you're taking normal closure files, like this is the closure, uh, this is the portal code, uh, but it works in any closure project. And you don't have to do anything special to get notebooks. All you do is right click, open with, and choose closure notebook. It's currently in Calva splits instead of Calva for weird VS code buggy reasons, um, but it still works. You just click this and then you get like this thing instead of getting the same file in a non, uh, in a normal text editor. And in here you've got like the normal notebooky stuff. You can click to execute and then you get the result below it. I've already executed a bunch of these mostly because they take a while. This is um, portals CI running thing and it shows pretty nicely why the new feature is said that uh, works pretty well because previously if you ran this you wouldn't really like here you might have seen the exception that was thrown but in here you would have basically seen nothing because it actually this code returns an atom that gets or like a promise that gets filled up um so usually you'd get the promise back and then there's nothing in here um, but now if I run it, I, it takes a while. Well, I should have cleared this previously. Eh, let me clear this cell while this is still running and hopefully it's gonna pop up right when this is done after like 10 seconds or whatever. Yeah, um, so you see that this gets populated after some time instead of in a, the, the in 
there immediately. And that happens because this has actual real interaction into back into the JVM. You can also see that by pressing something like datafy. Eh. I need to press that correctly. Well, apparently I'm doing it wrong at the moment. Um, anyway, usually datafy works. I think I can show it later in the data namespace. Um, the cool thing is when I change presentation here, I'm gonna show it uh, later as well, is this value isn't anything, like the actual value isn't in here. This is the value that I that the REPL gives back. And that's because a uh, portal can understand, like the portal extension in VS Code understands this thing and says, well, I kind of need to call back into our JVM on, this port and there's a portal server running the way you usually have a portal server running when you started um, in your JVM. And this value can now be like huge, right? Uh, one of the reasons um, I was really looking forward to this is that at work we have got one huge closure map in an atom that gets changed and like I couldn't use notebooks for this because it was always exploding my VS code. And now I can because it's just like, it's still just like, what is this? I don't know, 200 characters or whatever, um, instead of 20 megabytes of uh, hash maps, um, which is really nice. Um, and you can see all of these things are just these values that saying, well, portal, go grab that thing. In here, you can see some, well, I need to change. Oh, actually, I wasn't wanted to talk about this. Um, one of the cool things is this is not just a portal thing. Anybody can basically jump in here. Calva runs these uh, the, runs the code for you, but the display is just normal text as you can see. And you can write a plugin for VS Code that just says, "Well, I understand this Eden this X application Eden thing," and then you can take that Eden and print whatever you want. Um, and we didn't provide any crazy extra special thing for portal. Uh, it's just everybody basically can use this instead of this being portal. Um, and then we can run these things and show them and we've got rich interactions in here and there's pictures and whatever, like all the usual portal works stuff now. Uh, previously, it was breaking on some stuff because it was too large, or you couldn't interact back into the, the into the JVM to get like error infers and stuff. Yeah, you should um, go back to the Hacker News one real quick, and then start clicking on some of the keywords. Oh, sorry, no, in the like data namespace, oh. and then if you scroll up to the, I think it's like the, the second or third cell. So this is one of the other things you get is uh, sorry, go up a little bit. It's like the Hacker News set of keywords. Uh, yeah, right, right there. Oh wait, no, scroll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, were there show stories, news stories? Ah, this one. Yeah. So before, because everything was serialized as Eden, you wouldn't get access yeah. to any of the data find nav stuff. But so, sorry, uh, go go back real quick, and then click the metadata. So, like a part of data find nav is you can add metadata to maps, and you can say, oh, when you nav this data, call this function. So if you just double click one of those keywords, it should, in theory, call Hacker News and pull stuff from its API. Uh, so you can just keep like clicking through and it, so like nav is fully enabled now because it's connected to like real data or real real like functions and stuff. So so if, if you have any data find nav stuff, it should should also work. Which is really nice. Plus you can like all the normal stuff like go get type and whatever is suddenly working, which wasn't uh, before before you were well I mean it was working on some stuff that Eden knew the data. Uh, but some other stuff where you just like defined your own data type, right? Uh, that couldn't call back into the JVM to ask uh, for the stuff that you needed. And yeah. it works. Yeah, if you if you click on the whole set and then there's like the little thing that goes out, uh, it's like on the right. Yeah, click the little external link button. Oh. So what this will do is it'll take the value that you have and open it up in a new portal instance so you can like, cap like kind of capture it. And then this one is still connected to your, you see how it says JVM. So not only did it open it, it opened it up um, 
connected to your JVM. So if you double click this, it now should also work because it's like, it's literally like taking the value that you have in memory and just opening it up in a new portal window. We're talking about ChatGPT, and it's apparently listening. Um, yeah, and I was talking about in the, the, um, this being not a special portal thing. Chris built this for, well, for all of us basically, but it's not that Calva gave him superpowers and like we've got like this integrated API or whatever and only portal can do this. The thing that portal did is just provide this netbook renderer thingy um, inside like a package JSON. And this thing is the, the, the extra extension you have here. And then it's giving you like a domain JS. Well, I mean, it, for portal, thankfully it's uh, actually closure script. Um, and this thing basically just gets an event with a message that you can get and then you can print whatever you want. It's not super difficult to basically, where was I here, uh, to say, well, I don't like the way Portal is doing these things. I want to put my own viewer in here and then you will you would be one of these things. And you can like say, well, I understand Eden or Plain or Markdown or whatever. Um, and the new thing that we've got going now, which is why I'm, I'm talking about these notebooks again, um, a tiny little one line change inside Calva uh, that is basically saying to Enrapple, this is not a normal eval, this is a notebook eval. So anytime I press this, I'm sending like an eval to uh, to Enrapple with this code, right? And now I'm providing it one special extra var that's just saying, well, I'm in a notebook. That's all I'm saying, like nothing super portal specific or whatever. I'm just saying, well, this is a notebook. And now portal hooks into this. I've got the code for this uh, here somewhere. Um, it has like an, an eval middleware wrapper for, uh, for NREPL, and it can grab this eval and instead of returning whatever a normal print would return, it's returning this, uh, I was displaying this before, it's returning this. And if you guys wanted to hook in there as well, you could do the same thing. You would probably clobber yourself with uh, the, the middleware of portal. Uh, but the nice thing about the middleware is, well, you, I mean, it's middleware, right? You can like reorder it or the user can reorder it. It's not it, uh, set in stone. Uh, there's a, in the docs of portal, there's a description how the, the notebook wrapper thingy works. But basically I've put like an example in here. Uh, you're basically just putting in the middleware for portal and Apple wrap notebook. I'm also usually using the web portal, but like that's another thing. And then you could write the thing yourself and have your own thing, or you could start understanding the same structure that portal understands and hook in there as well, which is really nice. Um, so yeah, from our, from the Calva side, it's really cool that we didn't have to like write stuff that specifically just for one interaction with one library. It can like everybody can hook in there who's interested and say, well, we kind of want to provide our own viewers in here. Um, I've been talking with, uh, I, I'm really good with names. Uh, one of the clerk guys was also interested in uh, maybe putting the clerk viewers in here. And they had the same problem where it's like, well, it's nice to show Eden, but we, we would have like to have a richer interaction, right? And if you now put the, some special, uh, the, and it, I mean, the code is not very much, what, where is it? It's like basically 200 lines of code and half of it is doing other stuff. Uh, middleware in there so that clerk suddenly sends the values that it understands itself and the viewer itself can do rich interactions back and forth. So yeah, that's really nice. We're probably hopefully gonna get kindly in there as well at some point, right? Um, but yeah, that's it. Unless Chris wants to like, that's, this one actually has basically been his baby mostly. Uh, I've done, I've had the dumb idea of doing it through middleware so that I don't have to do anything. And uh, Chris can do all the work for me and I can look cool by, pro, uh, by presenting it. Um, but yeah, for me, it was one line change. Uh, and for him, it was a little bit more. So yeah, all the credit goes to you.
Yeah, so actually, uh, probably it makes sense uh, if, if you wish, Chris, to talk a bit about the picture on your side, uh, what it meant to, to add these uh, capabilities to Portal, uh, if you wish to comment about it. Oh, we didn't want to put you on this one. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are you saying I, I can elaborate on some of it? Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think. Do you want I, me to keep the code stuff open or do you want uh, to open yourself? I can or? share because I want to I want to take the like demo that you did and just add a little bit to it, but I have it all set up on my computers as well. So um, sure, then I'll stop sharing. Yeah, let's see. I can share um, this screen. I'll just share the editor. Yeah. OK, so you guys can see my VS Code, right? Yes. Uh, and uh, there is another thing that I was going to show with NPM, but I'll wait on that. Uh, but yeah, so like the to elaborate on, I think, what? Uh, um, I think you need to zoom in a little bit. Sorry, yeah. For me, it's fine, but I know I've got a huge screen, so. OK, is that, is that better? Yeah, looks great. OK, so the, to kind of dig into what Lucas was doing a little bit, like the like default portal build, uh, and like portal builds is just an example. It's not really the like main point, but it's just like normally you output data. Sorry, you don't output data. You output like text to a terminal, right? So I do this BBCI command and it just dumps all of this data to my terminal, um, which is, I mean, it does have colors, which is like kind of nice. And it does have some tables, which is kind of nice, but I've always wanted more than just that for like any output of any program. I kind of hate it when data goes to strings because that's where it feels like it goes to die. So I feel like I'm really excited about the notebook stuff because I can take all the same code that exists in the build and then run it as the notebook like he was, uh, like Lucas was uh, demonstrating. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up the same notebook that he had and I'm gonna show um, a little bit more that you can do as well uh, with an editor connected notebook is the like first cool thing is like normally you have to have like n commands and you have to know which command to call. Now you can just open up the notebook that has all of the code and you could just start like iterating on this one specific build. Like if your tests are failing or something and you want to just iterate on that one thing instead of running the whole build again or knowing the command to run that part of the build, you just click play on the code. Uh, I need to let me evaluate the NS. Okay. And then uh, I can rebuild it. And so uh, it's going to just run that part of the build. So I th already think that's like kind of nice. I don't know if you guys have that same pain where like, I don't, I don't want to run our entire build, but I want to, I don't have to have like n little commands to start this part of the build or that part of the build. Uh, and on top of that, now, if you take a look at the output uh, of what it used to look like, uh, which is like right here, it, it almost looks the same. So it's like an easy path to migrate. So like the test output is normal closure test output. And then I kind of do this fancy thing for table formatting. But again, this the thing that sucks is this this table is like an ASCII table and it's kind of, it's gone now and I can't do anything with it. Whereas uh, here, because I have it as data, um, I can actually do stuff with it like uh, select columns or something, uh, which that doesn't look like. I think there's, cause there, there's uh, metadata on it. But again, that's like another thing. I can view it as this thing. Uh, I can view it as, um, what is it called? Uh, I can pretty print it. And that's, that's literally the underlying data that's driving this table is now, uh, well, I think it's a different table, but it essentially it's like, it keeps the data intact as data, um, which is, I think really cool. Um, and like to play this, this to, to like play this game, your, your, or to use these viewers, your, your, your data just has to look like this. Uh, it's using like PREPL as the format, just because that's the thing I chose, but it did, it's not really important. Um, like you can have your own viewers that do other formats of data and render them however you want. Um, but if I go back to the PREPL viewer, this is what it looks like. The, the cool thing is for the test output as well, is like it's, uh, you, you have access to like more than, let me show you the whole thing that, so close your test when it generates data, it generates data that looks, exactly like this. I don't know if you guys can see, but it's just like a list of these test things, which actually, if you want a better look at it uh, in the table viewer, it looks like, um, I don't know if you guys can see. It, so these are the maps that are in that vector of like all the things that your test outputted. So you have access to all the data that your test uh, produced. Um, and like and like all this works in normal, like portal works in here. Cause it's like, it doesn't really care about where the data came from. It just cares about that it is data. Cause what you'll see is this came from like a process, uh, a closure CLR process got spawned. It ran all the things, produced all the data and then killed the process. Cause that's what the build does. Um, but if I go back to the test report viewer and I have an, I have a, 
runtime connected. It, it's connected to the JVM, right? But the data that I produced, uh, like on these vars, they have metadata. Sorry, oh, did it? Oh, I think I went, <laughs> I clicked the shortcut to go forward. Um, I go metadata. Yeah, uh, the vars have metadata on them, which has like file information. So I can like go through my test and if there's a failing test, I can use my editor connected commands, which are like go to definition, which this should work. It should open it up. Let's see. This one doesn't always like to work. Um, but in, in any case, I, I, I can take these values and inspect them in my runtime and do things with them. Um, so that, that's just that like color I wanted to add is to me, this is really exciting because like I, I want to build programs that produce data at, at every level, like uh, programs that I like our servers, but also build programs like build programs, in my opinion, should just produce data and we should be able to render that data however we want, whether it's um, like this or any, uh, you know, put some tables, I can copy it as Eden and share it with other people and just keep the data as data and not, and not have to worry about like ASCII pretty printing it. While, while still supporting that for systems that require that, right? Because this build also runs on GitHub and they don't have these facilities and that's okay. When I, when I don't want to have this rich output, I can just output the old way of doing things and kind of do both. So um, hopefully that, that like is, is cool. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be switching to notebooks for all my tests or for all my CI stuff just because it's, it's so convenient to just click play. And then like uh, the, 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 this ran in a uh, Babashka instance, this will run in a closure script, like node process that gets spun up. And it's cool because it all looks the same too, right? It all has like closure, closure script, closure shell. They're very consistent about their like stuff that they output. So I can take advantage of that in these viewers that are like trying to pattern match that data, uh, right? This kind of looks the same. Um, but yeah, that was the like uh, elaboration on that. There, there's some other stuff I could get into with the NPM stuff that I think I was going to talk about, but I don't know if we want to take questions on this first. So inspiring. Yes, so uh, yeah, I think it, it is a good time for questions to both Lucas and Chris. And yeah, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, the, uh, can you, you, I think you mentioned it briefly, but so uh, you have on the screen no target test. So that's uh, like a regular like bash command and then it out in, so do you parse the output or does the tool produce output that your tool uses or? So what, the, uh... exact, the exact data that portal gets is right here, uh, which I can view that as a table. It gets like a map with these, like it looks like pREPL data just cause that's what I, I have, but it has like tags. And then that, that data um, is, like errors and taps. Errors just because it's like not standard out. This is um, like the tap format is uh, a maps that have a tag. The tag can be error tap out in eval or something or ret for ret. I'm not sure. Can't remember. Uh, but the values that are tap are Eden, so I can render this in the Eden viewer and I can render this in the Eden viewer as well. So it, it's getting the data as strings and just parsing it because it knows that it's supposed to be in in Eden value. Okay, so it, it basically, yeah, it gets a, it gets like the string output from the running the bash command and then uh, yes. parses it. Okay. Yes, but not quite. So there is a little bit of instrumentation that I had to do in my test runner. And that's uh, if I go to like test runner CLJS, for example, um, right here for emitting a table, I check if the process got passed like a portal port. If so, then I can submit the data as data as like a tap output. So my sub process knows that it can tap values. Uh, and um, that that kind of makes the, delim del the delimiting of standard out, like, right, because your process normally has like two output streams, standard out and standard error. What if tap was also another avenue, which is kind of what you get with like PREPL is you have out error, tap, eval, and things like that. So what if we also gave our subprocess the ability to emit more than just standard error and standard out, it can emit data as well. And that's kind of what the parent that's spawning the subprocess is also providing a port. Uh, it's to an HTTP server that gets spun up quickly to just capture these uh, values. And I think they're just being sent as Eden. Um, okay, so when yeah. uh, when you say tap, because I tap is a closure core command that is an in-process yeah. facility. And when you say tap, you mean like send it to portal via 
a network request? Yes, it will send it to the parent process, uh, and then that process will somehow make it get to Portal's hands. Uh, and in in and in, in 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 this case, what, what's happening is that the sub process is being or like the HTTP server starts the sub process spins up. It like sends all the data via standard out, standard error, taps. Uh, it gets captured and formatted like this, right? And then that gets returned to the like the portal notebook viewer, which had no, it has no knowledge of any of that. It just says it just sees the data and says, oh, I know how to run this. Does that make sense? Right, but it's it's, a, it's eventually getting it's the the because there's the the question is just like um, it seems like portal is out of process from this sub process. Yes, and so you have to like. Uh, and the mechanism for getting it from process to process is a network socket somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's okay. an H it's using it's using the remote API that Portal has, but it, it doesn't have to be. Uh, it just so happens that okay. it's calling this right here, right? It's doing a, in in JavaScript it would call fetch. Or a, yeah, so it all makes sense. I'm just trying to make sure that I understand what yeah. uh, I'm seeing. This is uh, all really cool stuff. Cool. Yeah, so there's a little bit of in instrumentation, but this is kind of like, for me, the ideal uh, like workflow is just to like get get your build output as data, right? Because all the like all the stuff with like the keyboard uh, and like viewers, and then people adding ex ex extension viewers and all that stuff like that should continue to work as well. I have a question that's more maybe just about how what's possible with portal in the first place that I mean it, it might be kind of a category error but if you wanted to create a viewer for something that's dynamic like let's say you have um I don't know like a web socket connection and you want to view the messages as they're coming over the connection has anyone played around with like I don't know how you would do that. Maybe you could have like a named pipe if both processes are running like on the same machine and you could send to portal data representing like where it can find the message stream or, or something like that. So the interesting thing, uh, and m m maybe this will help is like, uh, there, there's one thing that um, portal knows about currently that is mutable, which is atoms. And that's on it. At the end of the day, that's how the top list works, huh? I said convenient. That's, yeah, that's yeah, it's helpful. like thing we use for all the, it, it doesn't, I mean, it might also know about volatiles, but um, at the end of the day, like those, like uh, the, the default mode of like uh, portal is you call open and it opens up an atom that when you call submit, it'll just con stuff into a vector. And so you actually don't even need any of that to use like portal. You can just have your own atom like, like this. Um, and so th this is another advantage of the uh, process connected notebook is okay i hope this works don't don't don't, don't make me look bad. <laughs> a conj hi right and i just eval this and you'll see uh there's there's Very like cool. kind of a, an a right there but i'm i'm mutating the output of the previous cell because the previous cell's value is an atom right like if i do like nil here so you don't see the like du 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 duplication right it's swapping into the atom right so i can also do uh empty let's do empty real quick yeah, um, you would have to, um, uh, what's it called? Shovel your data into an atom, essentially, and then you could view any anything you want. Cool. Yeah. Is, are there life cycle hooks for the viewers? Like, is there a way, if you're like, I don't want to see this atom anymore, I'm going to take it out of the notebook, could you add a hook to? Um, within the, the notebook context, um, you can delete the cell. I would say that that would probably be the easiest thing to do. I don't know where it is. Uh, here it is. There's the delete. I would say that's probably what you want to do. And then there are like garbage collection me mechanisms that kind of are like lower level things that are in portal that'll make sure that that value will get cleaned up, uh, which is what makes like the notebooks like you're not accumulating all that garbage, hopefully. It, it'll take a little bit of time, but I am proxying the stuff. Um, sure. Um, but yeah, I would delete stuff in like normal portal. We have like a, a separate window. You just have to remove it from the like data structure because at the end of the day, like portal is just like give me a data structure and I'll render it. So if you want stuff that's not, in, if you want to remove that that stuff from the data structure, you can just use your normal data structure operations. 
Cool, thank you. So I do have a question about this. And that is this portal UI, it's a plugin for VS Code or it's something like a library, a normal library that I can plug in in any place that I want? Um, both. <laughs> It, it's like it, it has many layers uh, and it, it um, what we're seeing here is the, the actual ex extension code exists uh, notebook here and it's pulling in all these all these namespaces from like the main code um, and it's like setting up some in infrastructure like like activate is a VS code specific thing um, this render output item is a VS code specific thing but everything else for the most part like RPC connect all this stuff is like, oh, I guess this is another VS Code sp specific thing, um, but all this code exists in isolation and it's consuming the like underlying UI library uh, that can also be used independently um, uh, of VS Code in entirely. Like right? that's how I can get the UI into IntelliJ and into, into a normal browser because it, it doesn't really care for the most part about who's hosting the UI. Um, as long as it can either get a like an, an Eden value which is how the original notebooks worked is like I parsed an Eden value and said, hey, portal, here's a value, render it. And it was like, cool. Uh, or um, it can connect to a runtime, which is kind of how the second mode of portal works when you when you have that NREPL middleware enabled, is it can be like, oh, you gave me a special value and I know that I need to call runtime and essentially dereference a pointer because that's what the client gets. Wonderful. So yeah, so the idea is I can put that on Pulsar, right? Yeah, yeah. Because um, uh, there's also like a, a completely standalone mode that requires no runtime. And it's just on the internet, you can download this, or not download, you can load up the UI independent of everything. And it'll still parse transit and eat in and all that stuff. Because all that's baked in a closure script anyway. Yeah, it should be able to pretty easily go into other editors like, like Pulsar. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we are uh, a little bit beyond the official time and, you know, uh, it felt like for a few of us it was okay to stay a little bit. And if it makes sense, I could share a little update about, kindly, uh, about this, this uh, namespace as a notebook uh, project, which is trying to, to offer some convention of how to, to, to uh, uh, express things uh, in a way that is uh, that should work across different tools and maybe after this short update we could have a discussion yeah so so uh, the the idea is that a few of us have been using this idea called your namespace as a notebook which is the general idea I think that a closure namespace is a nice way of expressing ourselves, of writing our, you know, having our workflow, exploring data, documenting things. And sometimes we would like this namespace to be rendered as a document. Well, this document could be a research report or some documentation of a library or a tutorial or anything else. And there have been different tools uh, uh, performing this workflow uh, allowing the user to have some workflow of this kind and oz and notespace and clerk and clay and calva notebooks i think are all something around that idea of having a closure namespace as the source of truth and render it rendering it as a document in some way and and then uh, uh, in the Cyclops community, we have been going through uh, tutorials and study groups and all kinds of things. And for a while, we were using NodeSpace, but then um, more, more elaborate tools arrived, like Clerk. And then we had a question, should we drop the old notebooks? Could we somehow keep going with the new tools, such as Clerk and Calva notebooks? But wouldn't we have any compatibility issues? Because expressing a namespace as a document requires some convention, some little details of saying how things should be rendered, how things should be viewed. So could we have some way of, of, of expressing things in a compatible way that would work in different tools? And 
And, and that is the main question that this project called Kindly is trying to, to answer. And Kindly is trying to be a convention of, for covering the basic needs of taking a closure namespace and specifying how things in that namespace should be rendered, like these slides we are seeing now, which are a rendering of a closure namespace in a certain way. And could we have a way that would be still some, somewhat customizable, but have sensible defaults and actually work in different tools? And at the moment, we have a proof of concept called Kindly, and a few of us are using it in our little projects. And it is supported by different tools, which can use it as a way to specify the rendering. So a few tools which are working is Clay, which is the tool I'm using to render these slides from the closure namespace. And uh, Clay creates an HTML document and with, with some closure script inside using the Skittle interpreter that Marcus was talking about. But Clay can also render a Quoto document with some Skittle inside. What is Quoto? Quoto is this general document rendering system which is used by different programming languages. And it is a whole ecosystem worth studying in a different session one day. But for us, it is not only an interactive way to create documents, but it is also a certain way to, to render things with very rich, uh, customizable uh, options like uh, having color themes and uh, syntax highlighting and rendering as slides. So this, these slides are generated by this tool called Clay, which is generating a quota document and has some quota options to render as slides. And it is using the kindly convention to express how things should be rendered. But this document can also be rendered as clerk uh, using clerk. So I think, uh, yeah, this is a clerk document rendering the same things, including tables and, and plots and so on, right? So it is the same namespace rendered as clerk uh, alongside the option to render it as slides. Uh, and the idea is that kindly is this convention allowing to express both, both things. And, you know, we could imagine this kind of um, specific use case, which is not so different from what a few of us are doing these days, where let us say two of us are working on a project and we, we share the same namespace and one of us is using Clerk and another one of us is using Clay just because they prefer a different tool to, to render things and some values we explore using portal. And then we render the documents using uh, Quoto because we like this uh, ability of Quoto to create a beautiful static website. But we encourage our users to, to use uh, Calva notebooks and, uh, and portal uh, as their main way of uh, playing with the code. And so most of these things are uh, supported and I'm looking into portal and Calva notebooks and learning them. and. Uh, hoping to make them compatible soon. And yeah, so maybe let us just play with it a little bit. And so you see, we can have this kind of, of um, uh, we, let's say we have a data set uh, of the tablecloth library, so we can render it uh, uh, printed as a data set, but we can also have a table view that, you know, you see we're saying this thing is of kind table, that is the kindly notation. So, uh, the, this way we know how to, to render it as using some interactive table view. Uh, so we can use, we can search and sort and so on. And if we use clerk for the same code, it would render using the clerk table view. And when we have portal support, it would use the portal table view. And we can have, can have data visualization. So here we're using the Hanami library and we are saying, okay, the result of this Hanami workflow is of kind Vega Lite, which is this data specification for plots. So yeah, it is working as Vega Lite, but uh, we're also working on a library called Nodge that would hide some of these 
details and have functions that already return things which are uh, annotated to have the, the desired kind. So we see that is how things would look using Nodge, uh, this work in progress library, where the result already has the kind Vega light. So we, the user doesn't uh, the user uh, doesn't have to to specify the kind of the resulting thing and they already get the plot and this plot would work in the different tools like clay and clerk and so on and yeah and also we are extending this uh, skittle uh, interpreter to have some uh, science related libraries so here for example we're using a uh, math box uh, this uh, library by by uh, uh, sam ritchie uh, i mean the closure script uh, wrapper of MathBox that uh, Sam Ritchie has uh, recently created. And so uh, we can create things like that. And again, we are hoping to make everything compatible across tools. And so that, that was a little taste of how th things are looking. Basically, we're just specifying that certain things are of certain kinds. And another thing um, we've been looking into is uh, backend computation. So we wish to create, uh, th this is already specific to Clay, but uh, Portal also has uh, really nice capabilities of uh, having a, a backend co connected to the browser view, as we saw. And, and uh, uh, these days, I'm looking into how to take something that has some backend computation. You see here, I'm simulated some, simulating some slow computation taking on the backend, and how to uh, embed it in the different kinds of documents, and then how to uh, take that and make it uh, rendered as a static document where the backend is not available anymore. So maybe uh, uh, I'll, uh, just to make it more clear, I'll render it in another view, not as a slide. So indeed, we can have things that rely on the backend, but then when we turn it into a document, we may wish to, to make the cache of the computation full so that it doesn't need to rely on the backend. So, uh, I'm playing with certain ways to, to kind of fill in the cache so that things are fast when you render things as a static document. And yeah, and uh, in the near term, uh, my attention is going to be a lot into making things easy around this kindly convention. And mostly Portal and Calva notebooks are things that I'm, I'm looking to uh, um, integrate with. And so that this, this is what I'm studying these days. And yeah, so, uh, this was a little update about Kindly. Uh, we are now uh, around uh, like half an hour after the official time, uh, maybe a bit later for a few people. Um, so maybe this is good time for discussion for those who may need to stay, but if anybody has to leave, then do you have any comments before you need to leave? Anything you wish to uh, comment about? Uh, I thought this was really interesting. Thank you very much. I've got to go, uh, but it's great to uh, hear about all these really cool things. Thanks. So nice to meet John. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll be right back. I just got to do something real quick. Yeah, so maybe it makes sense for those who uh, wish to stay a little bit to have a little break, as Chris uh, proposed. And uh, for those who wish to stay, we could meet again after five minutes or so. And maybe I'll stop the recording now. So does anybody wish to say anything before we say goodbye to the recording? Yeah, though, so thank you so much for all the amazing presentations. I think all the topics we saw today, each of them deserves a whole session. So let us... You know, if anybody wishes to talk more about what you were presenting, then let us have just a dedicated session for that. And uh, let us say goodbye to our friends listening to the recording, and uh, we'll keep chatting after stopping that. So goodbye.